Welcome everyone to the Collaborative Mentoring Webinar Series and thanks so much for joining us today. Today we'll be talking about youth purpose and how mentoring programs can intentionally foster it. I'm Jennifer Burgoyne, Program Manager here at Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership, and I'll be facilitating today's conversation, so let's get started. This webinar is part of the Collaborative Mentoring Webinar Series, which is funded by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention through the National Mentoring Resource Center and facilitated in partnership with Mentor. These webinars would not be possible without the planning team, which includes the amazing affiliates shown here on this slide. In addition to this webinar series, the NMRC provides many, many resources for mentoring practitioners. And at the end of today's webinar, we'll provide more details about how you can access this free support. Before we get started, I wanted to just share some housekeeping information. In about a week, you'll receive an email with information about how to download a copy of these slides and how to view the webinar recording. So please don't feel like you need to jot this all down in notes today. We'll send you the resources soon. Uh, and you can also access this information directly by going to Mentor's Collaborative Mentoring Webinar Series website in the next week. And if you just Google Collaborative Mentoring Webinar Series, it'll pop right up for you. And to continually improve this series, we're hoping you can provide some feedback. A short survey will pop up as you exit the webinar. Please take about three minutes to give us your feedback. I can tell you that I personally review all the comments every month and our team really uses that input to improve the series in the future. So thank you in advance. We want this to be an interactive and participatory experience. So you can use the question box in your control panel to ask questions throughout the webinar. My colleague here, Elizabeth Santiago, our Chief Program Officer at Mentor, We'll be queuing up questions to share with panelists during the Q&A portion of the webinar. We may not get to all questions because it looks like we have about 150 folks on the line, but we will definitely do our best. So we're going to start out today with a couple polls to see who's on the line um, and what our audience is comprised of. So I'm going to launch the first one here. So the first poll is, what is your experience level in the mentoring field? Are you a beginner, experienced, or expert? I'll give you a moment to answer. All right, let's take a look. So it looks like 71% are experienced. 17% say they're beginners, and 12% are experts. Well, welcome to you all. And then the second poll here, what is your role in the mentoring field? Are you a practitioner, researcher, technical assistance provider, funder, or other? Okay, let's see. Oh, we've got 62% practitioners. That's pretty standard for this series. 4% researchers, 8% TA providers, 2% funder, and 24% other. Curious what you all are. Feel free to write it down in the chat box if you want to share. Um, so welcome to everyone, and we think and hope that uh, today's information will be applicable to everyone on the line. All right, so our topic today is youth purpose. And I know for some of us, myself included, this topic may seem somewhat nebulous. It can be difficult to grasp what it means or looks like to have a sense of purpose. I think many of us might intuitively understand that a sense of purpose is beneficial. It can ground us, it can excite us, it can motivate us, it can inspire us. But what does it really mean for a young person to have a sense of purpose? Why is it important, and what can adults do to foster a sense of purpose? Today, we're excited to be joined by two expert panelists who will explore all of this with us. So on today's webinar, we're joined by Dr. Kendall Cotton-Bronk from Claremont Graduate University 
and Almani Vinny from the Kappa Alpha Psi Foundation. Dr. Bronk will review her definition of purpose and discuss why having a sense of purpose is beneficial to young people. She'll also explore some potential pathways to purpose. And Almani will discuss his program's approach to purpose development by exploring strategies and activities that foster youth purpose. So I'd like to introduce you to each of today's panelists a little more in depth. First, we have Dr. Kendall Cotton Bronk. Uh, she's an associate professor of psychology in the Division of Behavioral and Social Sciences. She's a developmental psychologist interested in understanding and supporting the positive development and moral growth of young people. Most recently, she has investigated these topics through the lens of young people's purposes in life. Her research has explored the relationship between purpose and healthy growth, the ways young people discover purpose, and the developmental trajectory of youth with strong commitments to various purposes in life. Work in her Adolescent Moral Development Lab is currently focused on creating and testing interventions for fostering purpose among young people, on understanding the development of purpose among marginalized youth, and on learning how global political and economic events influence young people's view of the future and their role in it. Her work has been funded by the Spencer Foundation, the John Templeton Foundation, and the Fulbright Foundation. Welcome, doc Dr. Bronk. Hi, thank you and for I'm, having me. Yeah, welcome. And I'm also excited to welcome Elmani F. Vinny. Mr. Vinny is the Executive Director of the Kappa Alpha Psi Foundation. He served for five years as the National Guide Right Chairman for the Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. In his position as National Guide Right Chairman, Kappa has become one of the nation's organizational leaders in youth development and mentoring of boys of color. Mr. Vinny is also a 20-year veteran teacher of social studies at Piscataway High School in Piscataway, New Jersey. In addition, he is the creator and program director of the 50 Strong Mentoring Peer Program, the school district's first ever peer-to-peer -peer mentor program for young men of color. Mr. Vinny is a proud graduate of Boston College, Go Eagles, and has been the recipient of numerous awards and stands as an advisor to several national organizations focused on education and youth. Welcome, Mr. Vinny. Hello, everyone. Hello. So I'm first going to turn things over to Dr. Bronk, um, who's going to introduce us to the topic of purpose, the definition of purpose, and talk about why this is an important conversation to have. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I'm, thank you for having me here today. I'm excited to share with you some of the research that we've been working on in our lab um, over the past 15 years or so. And um, as Jennifer said, when you think about purpose, it is kind of a nebulous term. It's sort of this big, abstract, amorphous, kind of philosophical concept. And when you want to conduct empirical research, um, it's really important to have a clear definition of purpose. Um, we also have to have a definition that can be operationalized. And by that, I mean measured so that we can see and we can all kind of agree on, yes, this is present or no, that's not present so that we can we can uh, agree on whether or not a sense of purpose um, is uh, exists or not. So the purpose uh, definition that we have used is stated here. Purpose is a long term forward looking intention to accomplish aims that are both meaningful to the self and of consequence to the world beyond the self. So I wanna highlight three sort of primary dimensions of this definition. The first is that a purpose in life is a goal. It's a, it's a far reaching aim and um, it may be attainable or it may not, but the important thing is that you can at least make progress toward it. So you may find purpose in trying to eradicate homelessness. And, um, you know, that may be a goal that is not really attainable, fully attainable anyway, in your lifetime, but it's definitely something towards which you can make progress. The second component of this definition that's important to highlight is that a purpose in life is really personally meaningful. And that may seem obvious, but it's a good reminder, particularly as um, mentors who might be interested in helping young people discover their purpose in life, a purpose comes from within. It's not something that a mentor, a parent, a teacher, anybody else can sort of you know, thrust upon somebody else. Um, the purpose really comes from within. 
And in our empirical studies of purpose, we look for evidence that a goal is particularly personally meaningful. Um, when we see people investing their time or their energy or their resources toward making their, their long-term goal a reality. So um, as we sort of measure personal meaningfulness, that's what we're measuring is the, the investment of time and energy and resources. And then the third component of this definition that's really important to highlight is that it is of consequence to the world beyond the self. And so what that means is that um, not everything is a purpose in life. Only those aims that sort of situate you in the broader world and allow you to make some sort of contribution to the broader world are said to be purposes. And this is a really important part of the definition from a research perspective because when we're conducting research, we have to have terms that are very, um, like I said, carefully defined, but also distinguished from one another. And it's this latter part of the definition that distinguishes purpose from the related concept of meaning. And so in our daily lives, we might use purpose and meaning interchangeably. But from a research perspective, we actually differentiate the two. So a purpose is actually a subset of a broader sort of meanings. Anything that is personally significant can be said to give your life meaning. But only those long-term goals that allow you to make a difference in the broader world can be said to give your life purpose. So let me give you an example. Um, you might go take a walk in the woods, and that might be really personally meaningful. We would say that represents um, a significant source of meaning for you. On the other hand, another individual might say, um, I really want to work hard to preserve the environment. And that would be an example of purpose. So hopefully you can see how, you know, one is how purpose is different from meaning, because like I said, when we're conducting research, it's really important that we have these distinctions. Um, and this is the definition, what's written up here, that has guided much of the empirical work on purpose to date. Um, young people, based on this definition, find purpose in caring for their families, in pursuing careers that will allow them to contribute to the broader world in a meaningful way, in supporting social or political change, in contributing to the arts, in leading lives of faith, as you can see, there are lots of different ways for young people to discover uh, purpose for their lives. But this is the definition of purpose that we're using um, in empirical work on the topic. So purpose um, has really only become a topic of research um, in the last 15 to 20 years or so. Like I said, we started with a definition and looking over the research over those past 15 years or so, um, there are at least two findings that have emerged as really clearly. And this is the first one. That is that leading a life of purpose is beneficial in more ways than one. So in my mind anyway, there's some fascinating research going on that looks at the relationship between physical health and leading a life of purpose. And so it turns out that um, individuals with purpose compared to uh, individuals without purpose have improved cardiovascular and metabolic markers. They have reductions in chronic pain. They report a regression in some cancers and in some other autoimmune diseases. And of greatest interest to me, um, individuals with purpose sleep better. And um, we think this might actually be one way uh, that uh, purpose contributes to this whole host of physical um, indicators of health. Um, more recently, we've had studies looking at longevity. Turns out individuals with purpose actually live longer than individuals without. So clearly, leading a life of purpose leads to all kinds of physical benefits. Um, and not only does um, is it the case that individuals with purpose live longer lives, but they also seem to live more fulfilling lives. So in the psychological space, there's been a lot of research that links uh, the presence of purpose to indicators of psychological well-being, things like hope and happiness and life satisfaction. And then of particular interest to us, since we're interested sort of in youth purpose, we find that individuals with purpose um, also report a variety of um, indicators of academic success. So individuals with purpose tend to be grittier um, and more resilient than their non-purposeful peers. 
They're also more likely to report an internal locus of control. And what that means is that they report that their schoolwork feels as though it's under their control. If they work harder, they can do better. And if they don't work as hard, they're not gonna do so well. They do not feel as though the schoolwork is, you know, it's, it's up to fate or my teacher uh, just gives the grades, I have nothing to do with it. Um, so it's really important. Students who are successful in school tend to report higher levels of internal locus of control. And then lastly, individuals with purpose report having higher levels of academic efficacy. And that just means that they are confident that they can be successful in school, which is, of course, a big indicator of actual academic success. So that's really the first big sort of clear finding to emerge from this past, say, 15 years of research on purpose, is that leading a life of purpose is a good thing. The next big finding to emerge is that leading a life of purpose is actually rare. Um, only about one in 10 middle schoolers reports having a purpose in life, one in five high schoolers, and by college, about one in three. So there's definitely a progression where um, young people are increasing, there are increasing rates of purpose over the course of adolescence, but even into adulthood, rates of purpose top out at about 40% um, among midlife adults. Later in life, rates of purpose drop precipitously. And we think this has to do with the fact that older individuals who might have found purpose in work, well, they're likely to retire. Um, if they might have found purpose in caring for their families, well, their adult children are likely to, you know, grow up, move out of the house, and maybe not need them quite so much. And, of course, um, health issues set in, and so individuals who might have found purpose doing work in the community or in the environment or something, you know, sometimes they're unable to engage in that work. So for a variety of reasons, it actually uh, gets uh, quite low later in life. But I want to focus on adolescence here. Um, just a little bit. So purpose um, requires this sort of hypothetical deductive reasoning where you have to kind of think forward and imagine what your life could be like and what it is that you want to accomplish. And that level of thinking is very challenging for children. So we don't typically look at purpose um, development among young children, not until adolescence are they cognitively equipped to start thinking about the sort of abstract reasoning required to seriously consider um, what it is they want to accomplish in their lives or what their purpose is. And again, if you look over the course of adolescence, there is sort of this steady increase in rates of purpose. Um, Erickson back in the 1960s talked about how um, purpose develops alongside identity. So as young people are figuring out who they want to become, which is, you know, issues of identity, at least some are also figuring out what it is they want to accomplish, which is, of course, their purpose in life. So I think this, again, for mentors, is an important thing to keep in mind. If you're working with middle schoolers, um, you want to have realistic expectations about how many of the young people are actually sort of cognitively ready to even think about these issues. Um, and, you know, if you're working with a young person who doesn't seem to have a purpose in life, important to keep in mind that it might just be the case that they don't have a purpose yet. It still is, is coming and there's still time to develop it. So anyway, that's the second big finding that I think has emerged over this course of research, which is that leading a life of purpose is rare. <clears throat> And taking these two findings together, that leading a life of purpose is a good thing, and yet that it is a rare experience, um, we got interested in seeing, you know, can we intentionally foster a sense of purpose in the lives of young people? Over the past few years, um, we've seen increasingly numbers of schools, mentoring programs, um, career development programs. They're all interested, and many of them have designed programs that they hope foster purpose, but the vast majority of these programs have not conducted any kind of rigorous evaluation, so we don't really know if they work. And we don't really know, um, looking in the academic research, there was very little research to suggest whether or not it is even possible to sort of intentionally work toward helping a young person develop a purpose in life. But given that, you know, leading a life of purpose is such a good thing and such a rare experience, this is something we wanted to investigate. 
um, we um, wanted, to, we decided it would be interesting to try to create some kind of toolkit that we could share is sort of quick and easy way with as many young people as we possibly could. So what we uh, did was to create an online toolkit. We actually created two toolkits. And as we started thinking about these toolkits and what they might look like and what kinds of activities they would entail, like I said, there really wasn't a lot of empirical work to provide guidance for us. Um, but there was this one study that we had conducted early on that, um, that provided some way forward. So when we first started conducting research on the topic of purpose, we started by administering surveys to young people, thousands of young people across the country. And we had planned to conduct surveys three times over the course of a five-year period. So every two years we would be conducting, we would be collecting surveys. And in between the survey periods, we would follow up with interviews with a subset of the young people who had completed the surveys. So the surveys were designed to give us some indication of how many young people across the country report leading a life of purpose. And the interviews were designed to get young people to, to tell us about, you know, what does a purpose look like? What does, where does it come from? How does it develop? And so we conducted our surveys and we followed up with interviews and we were just amazed. The young people who we interviewed kept coming back to us and saying, wow, nobody's ever asked me these kinds of questions before. This is really amazing. And they asked us, can you send me the tape? I know you um, tape recorded my interview and I said some good stuff there and I don't wanna lose that. People wanted the transcriptions. And so we started to think, wow, <laughs> I wonder if this interview might not have actually been an intervention. Obviously, that wasn't the intention, but we were just so um, surprised to, by the young people's reactions to it. So when we went back to conduct surveys again about nine months later, we looked at those young people. Um, a colleague of mine, uh, Matt Bundick, did this research, and he looked at those young people who had participated in the interviews, and lo and behold, they did report significantly higher rates of purpose at time two. So at time one, they had looked just the same as the other young people, but by time two, they had significantly higher rates of purpose. So, um, so we decided to take that interview and sort of translate it into a set of online activities um, the way it works, young people will get online and they'll spend about 15 to 20 minutes three times over the course of a week um, completing activities. And the activities in this purpose toolkit, um, which is sort of reflected by the, in that core values image, they would reflect on things that really matter to them, focus on making long-term plans, and think about how they want to leave their mark in the world. So one activity in this toolkit has young people, again, this is a toolkit designed for adolescents, so it has late night talk show host Jimmy Fallon. Um, in a three minute video clip, he talks about how he um, fell and he broke his finger and he landed in the hospital and he had, it was in the hospital actually for some time, it was a pretty bad uh, break out of surgery. And while he was in the hospital, he's, he's talking about how he read Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. And he talks about how reading this book helped him discover his own purpose in life. He said, um, you know, I realize that life is hard and there are dark times that all people are going to go through. And he said that, you know, for him as a comedian, he found purpose in lightening the mood and making people laugh, particularly when they're in these challenging circumstances. So young people watch this three minute video and then they respond to some written prompts where we say, you know, this is how Jimmy Fallon finds purpose. How do you think, uh, what are the things that you think, um, you know, you might be able to offer the world in terms of your skills and talents and things like that. Um, one of the other activities is an email activity where we have young people send um, five emails to five adults who know them well. So people like uh, extended family members, coaches, uh, teachers, employers, and we ask, um, we have a prompt created for them. And the prompt says, uh, you know, in five minutes or less, can you please answer these questions for me? What do you think I'm particularly good at? What do you think I really enjoy doing? And how do you think I'll leave my mark? And it turns out that although young people don't always know what their purpose in life is, um, sometimes the people close to them have a pretty good idea. So anyway, those are the kinds of activities um, that the young people complete in the purpose toolkit. 
In the interviews that we conducted, we also noted that a lot of young people cited gratitude as a reason for pursuing their purpose in life. So for example, we interviewed a young woman who said, I want to become a teacher, but I don't want to be one of those teachers who just, you know, clocks in, clocks out, does her grading and calls it a day. I want to be one of those teachers who makes a real difference in the lives of her students. And we said, well, that's interesting. Why? Why is that important to you? And she went on to explain that when she was in high school, her parents had gone through a difficult divorce and there was a teacher who had really reached out to her. And she was very grateful for the help of this teacher and she wanted to become a teacher to provide that same kind of help and support to other students who might need it. So whereas the Purpose Toolkit really focuses on activities designed to help you sort of uncover your core values and your long-term goals and things like that, the Gratitude Toolkit only included activities designed to cultivate gratitude. So things like, you know, for uh, for one week, write down um, three good things that happen every day. Um, write a gratitude letter where you identify someone who's really helped you in your life and you reach out to them and, and acknowledge how you've benefited from their help and how they have, you know, uh, it has cost them something, whether it's time, energy, or effort, and how you're thankful that they've helped you. And so anyway, both of these toolkits are completed online. Um, like I said, this young people log in three times and complete 15 minutes worth of activities each time, but they do it over the course of the week. And it's intentional that we leave time between the activities because even though they're only working on the activities for 15 minutes, we hope they're thinking about them a little bit in between. And on the next slide, I can share with you some of our results. Um, we also had a control condition where young people logged in um, on the same schedule online, but instead of uh, the gratitude or purpose toolkits, they created, uh, they completed activities designed to enhance memory. And um, so as you can see, they completed surveys of purpose before they started the intervention, after they completed the intervention, and then the lag is one week later. So um, rates of purpose increased significantly in the gratitude and in the purpose condition, and they remained uh, high at least a week later, and they did not change in the control condition. So our main takeaways from this, um, particularly for mentors, um, let me share some of those highlights with you now. First, I wanted to just share a website with you. If you go to, or if you know of any young people who are seniors in high school, um, there's something going on called the Purpose Challenge. And um, the Greater Good Science Center and uh, social, which is at uh, UC Berkeley and the social impact firm ProSocial are trying to start a national conversation around purpose. So they have launched a scholarship opportunity where young people can go online and they complete our purpose fostering toolkit, the one that I just told you about. And then they write a purpose inspired college essay, which they will upload online for a chance to win up to $25,000 in college scholarships. So if you know of any young people who might be interested in doing that, encourage them to go online. Um, the scholarship is uh, opportunity is opened uh, until February. I don't know exactly when in February it closes, but you have at least a few weeks or at least a couple weeks to participate. Um, so we're excited that these toolkits are being used on a nationwide level. But more than that, we're also we're just we're really excited to know that it does seem to be quite possible and even relatively easy to help young people discover a purpose in their lives. Um, one of the interesting things is if you look back at the slide before, you'll note that the gratitude was actually slightly more effective at fostering purpose than the purpose toolkit. And in some of our sort of exit interviews, we realized that, and this makes sense, um, when you ask a young person, 17, 18 years of age, you know, what's your purpose in life? That's a pretty intimidating topic. And we figured it might actually be more comfortable to approach the topic through things like, you know, what are you really grateful for? And focusing on the, the blessings in your life and on the people who have blessed you seems to sort of naturally incline them to start to think about how it is they want to give back. So anyway, something to keep in mind is that approaching gratitude um, indirectly, I'm sorry, approaching purpose indirectly may be an effective way to cultivating it. 
Interestingly, there's a researcher named Dr. Keltner at UC Berkeley who has looked at awe. And awe is really that feeling of being in the presence of something vast that really transcends your understanding of the world. And cultivating this sense of awe has also been found to help foster purpose. So I think there is something to thinking about these indirect routes. Um, tackling purpose directly can work, as we saw here, but, um, but it may, may be even more effective to think about uh, approaching purpose through some of these other routes. Um, so I think I will leave it there and uh, turn things over back over to Jennifer. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kendall. That was really fascinating. I thought it was really interesting to hear how rare youth purpose is, but what the benefits are and, and how relatively easy it is to cultivate it. So that was awesome. Thank you for sharing. Um, I know some folks are sending in questions. If folks on the line have more questions about anything Dr. Bronx just shared, please use that question panel to send them in. And we've saved some time at the end of today's webinar to review some of them. So I'm going to now turn things over to Elmani Vinny, who's going to delve into the mentoring practitioner side of how mentoring programs can really foster youth purpose. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Elmani Esvani. I'm once again the executive director of the Cap Alpha Foundation. I'm also um, an educator. Um, I am a teacher of social studies, and I'm also the director of the peer mentoring program at Piscataway High School known as 50 Strong. So I'm gonna lead off with this concept of how do you cultivate purpose within young men? And I'm gonna pull from, uh, in, in the sense of case study and experience, my work I've done as a youth mentor um, with my mentoring organizations, not only in my high school, but in uh, Jersey, New Jersey, where I also volunteer, and my past experience uh, with um, our work we've done in Cap Alpha Psi with our Guide Right and Kappa League program. I want you to take a look at this picture here. And for all of us that have been mentors or we run mentoring-based organizations, we need to think about the context of, before we get into cultivating purpose, but actually what is the positioning of our mentors? If you look here, everybody should be familiar with Star Wars, preferably speaking, this was the best of um, all of the series, uh, The Empire Strikes Back. <clears throat> and you see Luke Skywalker. And on his back, you see Yoda. Now, I chose this picture because of the positioning. Now, for everybody that knows Star Wars, knows that in this picture, Luke is the student and Yoda is the master. Yet, Yoda is the one behind Luke. Now, why is that important? Sometimes what happens in our industry and in the, in the sector of mentoring is mentors sort of kind of um, um, bring in, actually you can bring up the next part of positioning here. If you take a look here, sometimes what happens is mentors and mentees build a leader follower position. I'm the mentor, I lead, you're the mentee, you follow. While we understand that, what can happen inadvertently is sometimes mentors could sort of kind of put their beliefs and their philosophies onto the mentee and even try to guide them in the way that the mentor has lived their life and even in terms of their career, whereas the mentee may be looking to go a different direction. And so what is important for our mentoring organizations to train our mentors to do is allow the mentee to lead from the front, and therefore it neutralizes our leader-follower position. And what it does, it maintain focus on making sure the mentee follows their own unique path and for mentors to gather a true understanding of the skills, passions, and potential of the mentee. Meaning, let's look at the mentee for their unlimited potential and let's see where that goes with the proper guidance. You can move on. And so when we run our youth programs, we focus on three things. So the first thing is we ask the mentor to focus on working with the mentee to determine what skills that they are great at doing. This comes through a line of questioning, and I'll get into those activities in a little bit. But when we talk about this aspect of purpose, really getting the mentee to understand the skills that they have. Many young people coming up are never asked that question. 
And so they're never asked to dig. They're never asked to sort of kind of do discovery in terms of what are the things that they are great in. What we know um, and research has shown that everyone has a skill set in which they're better than 10,000 other people in the world at. So everyone is born with a particular skill set as something that they're better than most people within their circle. The next one is passion. Once we find that skill set, then it's about helping young people find that passion. Now, passion is important because passion is about, hey, what is it that you love? This is something that not just comes to you naturally, but it's something that you wake up every day excited to do. It's something that nobody has to really force you to do. Most importantly, it's something that, that when you do it, that even when you account for obstacles and challenges, you are more than willing to take on those challenges. And even if you fail at those challenges, you still have no problem getting up. There are no second thoughts, but that you keep fighting and you keep wanting to work at it. That's your passion, you know, what it is that you love. Now, interestingly enough, for a lot of us, when we do the discovery and we help our mentees with the discovery, there is a correlation between the thing that we're great at and the thing that we love to do. And so as mentors, we have to help our young people sort of kind of cultivate those things there. Now, I want to give one sense of caution. I think this is something we can apply for all of ourselves. It's very important to understand that there's a total differentiation between the things we're great at versus the things we're good at, the things that we love versus the things that we like. And so when, and, but that only comes with building a strong relationship with your mentee. But for most of us, I think as we'll experience, we tend to end up doing things that we're good at and then doing things that we like. But they're not, suppo they're not sometimes the things that we're great at and the things that we love. So when you talk about this cultivating, this purpose exists on this rarefied air area, right? The things that we're great and the things we love. And then last but not least, what brings it home is the impact we wish to bring to the world. When we cultivate purpose, people see it more than just, oh, this is what I want to get paid to do. They see it more than just ego or fame. They actually believe that they're contributing something greater to the lives of the people around them or even to the lives of people that they'll never meet. And so once again, the cultivation of purpose comes when we help our mentees discover the skills that they are great at doing, the things in which they love to do, and then helping them articulate it in a way in which they see it as an impact um, that they're bringing to the entire world. You go to the next slide. Now, what are, at, what are some of the things that you can ask? Here's a, a way you can frame it. When we look at cultivating purpose, first thing the mentor can do is the line of questioning, asking once again to the mentee, what are your passions? You know, what are your skills? Now, I want to be cautious with every single one of these, but especially this first quadrant. This is going to take time. This is not something that happens overnight. You have to build a relationship with your mentee. Some of your mentees are quiet. Some of them shy. We also don't know the level of experiences and what other layers you're dealing with with things. What type of household they come from. What, did they experience trauma? Do they have supportive family? Are they in an area where they have to overcome a lot of adversity? So here, you, you have to be patient. For some, your mentee, you may get it the first time you meet them. But for others, it's, it's not surprising to see six months, seven months, eight months. I had a mentor, mentee, I'm sorry, where he was in my program for four years. And I kid you not, it wasn't until his last year in the program that he really began to open up to where he really started to allow himself to just begin to talk about what he thinks his passions were and his skills are. So I want to be clear here. You, you want to ask questions, but be cautious not to press and be cautious not to let um, anything superficial come out or, or try to uh, gerrymander it to come out. It will take time. It, it has to follow a natural human process. But questioning is so important. And by the way, it also comes with building trust uh, between mentor-mentee. Next, visioning and discovering. 
the mentor focused on having the mentee gather a sense of clarity on direction and destination. Okay, we'll go into some activities you can do in a second, but yeah, you need them to then begin to envision. Simply having them talk about it is not enough. You have to begin to have them envision it, putting it down on paper, writing it down. What do you see? That's the first step in making it real. The second step in making it real is practice. The mentor presents scenarios, exposes the mentee to various environments and locations that align with, align with the passion and skills of the mentee. I'll get into placement in a second, but this is something also that a lot of times we sometimes can miss the boat on. In our program, once we begin to cultivate purpose, we make it a point to invite them into, uh, bring them to career fairs, college fairs, um, bringing guest speakers. But we try as best as possible to put them in the environment so that they can see themselves in there and then ask them, how does that feel? Does this feel right in the area in which you are in? So simply taking them out of the space of mentor-mentee conversation and putting them in the environments in which they envision is critical to cultivating purpose. The next, last but not least, is placement. This is where it becomes very real because the mentor serves as an advisor in aiding the mentee in establishing concrete goals, objectives, and actions that are utilized to create the plan of action and place on the direction towards working in their purpose. To simply tell them you can do it without telling them do what? To simply say you can go here without helping them the process to get there is not enough. And as a matter of fact, I, I, I give warning to say that can be damaging. If you tell a student, hey, we see that your purpose, you come to the conclusion that they're supposed to be in STEM and they're supposed to work for Blizzard Entertainment. Uh, we are working on, let's say, Overwatch, and that's their love. Well, then part of that placement, for example, would be let's start looking at applications for MIT or Northeastern University. That's where it becomes real, or here's this enrichment program. But that's where it becomes real. That's where the, the, the mentee starts saying, I actually see myself going in this direction. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So this is close to my final, I think my final slide, close to my final slide. Once again, here are just some simple activities. And, and I keep it simple because ultimately every single one of you run your mentoring programs. You need to be able to conform your activities to the population, the demographic, the environment, and the resources that you have. So I'm very cautious here on being too specific about activities. But I'll say in first quadrant, you see conversations, normal get-togethers, meetings with mentees. Group meetings are always good, but keep them small. Peer-to-peer -peer meetings are always good. Once again, keep them small. But lines of questioning and just general conversation, have them open up about their opinions, what they think about things, how they see, what they feel. Next, moving on to visioning. I love vision boarding activities. I think they're great. Also. Activities such as using a strengths finder, allowing students to discover what it is they're into. Next, moving on, and this is the fun part, field trips. Can't stress enough. Field trips, bringing in guest speakers, but doing things that puts each mentee in hands-on scenarios. And then lastly, placement. You see the college application process, scholarships, enrichment programs. To me, those are more critical than the college application process because if you have young kids, you can't wait until they're seniors to begin any form of tangible placement. So looking at summer programs or looking at this program or bringing them to this event, those things are also critical, internships, and, of course, jobs. So that, that's just an overview of the type of activities. And uh, next slide. Thanks so much, and, Elmani. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. So, Didn't mean to cut you okay, off. Okay. So no problem. So just to, just to follow up, the biggest thing for everybody here, though, I, I got to say, though, is positioning. Make sure you've positioned yourself in deferment to the mentee. The mentee must feel empowered to follow their unique path. And we as mentors must act as the guide that understands one fundamental thing, that all of our young people have unlimited potential. Our job is to help guide them and cultivate that. 
So having that positioning and then following that path is critical to helping our young people find their purpose. Thank you. Thanks so much, Almani. That was really great. It's so helpful to hear the intentional strategies and concrete activities that your program is employing to really foster youth purpose. So thank you for sharing. Um, so I know we've been getting some questions through the question panel. I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth Santiago, our Chief Program Officer here at Mentor, to share some of those questions with the panelists. Thank you, Jen, uh, and thank you, Kendall and Elmani. This is a, a very interesting uh, topic so far, and we've been getting lots of wonderful questions. So first, let me um, take care of some of the easier ones. Um, so uh, Kendall, people are interested in getting a copy or access to the toolkits and the survey questions, and I uh, want to be sure that those are available via the links that are in your presentation that folks will get in about a week or so, but I just want to be sure that that's the case. Um, actually, there's probably better to go look online. We have a website called fosterpurpose.org. Okay. And on that website, you'll find the toolkits um, and lots of information about how, so you can actually try out both toolkits. You can play, try the activities individually from the toolkits, and uh, or you can try the whole thing. And there's some information about those there. So that's probably the best place to go. And then, of course, the other option, if you have a uh, high school senior, is to go to the purposechallenge.org website. Um, and then they can participate in the uh, um, scholarship opportunity. Oh, that's wonderful. And are the toolkits, by any chance, in other languages? They have not been translated, no. We have, um, we have thought about it. And uh, we have not done that yet. Okay, thank you. Um, and I have another question for you and maybe a little bit more complex. But what would you describe as a realis realistic expectation uh, for mentoring organizations working with children live in, living in severe poverty, uh, knowing that that has an effect on cognitive development? Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. We've done research um, in a variety of contexts, we're doing research with street children in Liberia, and, and we are finding purpose there. So these are youth who are um, living in probably the most you know severe context you could imagine. Um, one of the really interesting things we found, we did another study looking at purpose among young people in low-income areas here in the Los Angeles Unified School District. And um, we actually found that the rates of purpose among young people, and so we, we looked at young people in a school district where 80% of the students were in a, uh, were eligible for free and reduced lunch, which means they're living at a pretty low um, socioeconomic status level. And um, then young people at a school where only 20% of them were, so that's much, were eligible for a free and reduced um, school lunch, so meaning that they were much more middle, middle class. And we found that rates of purpose were actually identical. Now, we were looking at slightly older young people. They were eight, 17 and 18 year olds. They were rising seniors and, and seniors in high school. Um, but I actually think that some of the challenges associated with growing up um, either from a low socioeconomic background or from an ethnic minority background when young people are able to sort of take those challenges and connect them with opportunities for future action, we found that rather than deterring the development of purpose, they could actually serve as catalysts for its growth. And I think that's a really critical role for a mentor to play. Young people, um, I do think, you know, if you have to think about the cognitive development, developmental level, but as they get older, young people from even more challenging backgrounds are definitely cognitively capable of discovering a purpose for our lives. And like we said, they might actually have, um, th there might be a role to play with uh, mentors in helping young people think about the challenges they confront as opportunities for future action, for meaningful future action. And in that case, like I said, we found some of those um, things that seemed like they would otherwise be impediments to purpose actually serving as um, um, catalysts for its growth. Mm -hmm. If I can, and that's correct, if I can jump in here on, on that aspect to everyone here, I think that's why, um, from a practitioner standpoint, and as an educator, I've been in the high school system for 20 years, I think that's why a couple of things are very critical. The first thing that's incredibly critical, especially when dealing with children, doesn't matter what ethnic group, um, that they come from, uh, from a low-income area, it is very important 
two, that the mentor does not um, take whatever, um, I don't want to say stereotypes, but maybe, um, you know, hidden biases that they may have and place it on, on a young man. I want to give you a very, very quick example. Um, one of my mentees that I had, uh, we took him one time to a, a career event, and there was another mentor with one of his mentees, and he met my men mentee. And I remember him saying to my mentee, he said, okay, keep it up because, you know, you want to make sure you stay out of trouble and you don't want to end up in jail. Well, though my mentee came from a low-income area, my mentee is, was in, eight, was in eight, four AP classes, did a 1420 on his SAT, and now has a four-year academic scholarship at Northeastern University. And so that's why you've got to be very careful here. That's why I call it purpose. You gotta make sure you look at everybody as being uh, having an unlimited potential. I've taught about 2,000 students, and I will tell you, there's a number of kids that hit the free and reduced lunch aspect, but that when they're cultivated and given the same type of benefit of the doubt in terms of that they can be anything they want, and then they are guided through with the proper resources and the time of guidance. Um, that excuse that bell in the background. Um, but that when they're when they're provided that, that they oftentimes will have the same level of success as those that come from higher incomes, and in some cases better, because sometimes from the higher incomes, those young people I've personally seen oftentimes are forced into different careers because of their family and family background. So that's just what I wanted to you know make sure that that was said when we're dealing with either communities of color or individuals from um, low economic backgrounds as it pertains to um, purpose. Thanks, Almani, that, that's a great point. And um, since you're making so many great points, uh, I've got a couple questions for you around whether you have uh, resources to share on a website or, or something where that folks can go to and, and learn a little bit more about your model. Okay, sure. Well, the, what I would say is they can go to um, our guide right program that we designed. Um, this is through Cap Alpha Psi, and it's www.national, um, it's N-A-T-L, in this case it'll be the abbreviation, N-A-T-L, Kappa, K-A-P-P-A, League, L-E-A-G-U-E, dot org. And that gives you the framework for our youth-based programs and our initiatives that we work on there. You can look there. We also have resources in terms of on the Kappa Foundation site, and that is um, www.thekappafoundation.org. Uh, and then, of course, um, you can get my email address if you ever want to just reach out to me. Um, you can reach me at lviney, V-I-N-E-Y, L as in Larry, V-I-N-E-Y, at pway.org. And I'd be more than happy to speak or go deeper with anyone that's in need. Thank you. That's very kind uh, to share your your email. Um, so mm -hmm. I have a, another a question, in either for for you, Almani, or for Kendall. Um, I had a couple of folks ask about uh, their since their programs are online. Have you uh, found any uh, effective strategies for online mentoring programs or ways to incorporate this in in that type of environment? Mm, online. Um, I have not seen them in depth. Um, I, I think the thing that's most important, I think the one thing about online um, that I, I, I will just recommend, can it be done? Yes, I'll say this. It can be done. Um, these kids are tech savvy and they like interacting online. Um, I think it's important, though, that there's an intentionality of activities that the mentor has when they're working with um, youth online, I think that, and then the other thing that I believe is critical to this is that um, the mentor must be sure to stay consistent, in this case, even more than physically, where you can change schedules, so forth and so on. But I think consistency in meeting um, and making sure that you're still meeting at the right time um, when you're online is also critical. But outside of that, I, really, I know there's e-mentor, but I really haven't seen um, models where this is particularly done. But I think that the mentor needs to have um, specific activities and actions mm -hmm. to really help motivate that. I'm, and I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Um, so 
In some programs, they meet only online. Um, they do maybe, you know, one-on-one -on -one time uh, via some virtual platform. And so uh, wondered if there were ways to integrate purpose um, or a focus on purpose in those environments. Right, right. Okay. Well, yeah, so ours was all online and, and the, you know, it worked very, um, very well. So I definitely think that, that it can be done online. Um, and um, one of the other uh, things that we had was that interview. Um, and there's actually, I should probably share that resource too. It is possible to use that interview. I think that would be a great opportunity for a mentor to um, go through sort of the questions in the interview, which we also found significantly increased rates of purpose. Um, and you could do that, uh, you know, there's no reason you couldn't at least do it over Skype or something. Um, so I think that it would, I think it's a nice opportunity to develop a purpose in the context of, a, of a, you know, face-to-face -face relationship. But as we saw from our study, it's, um, it's not necessary. You can also, you can definitely do it through these online resources. Perfect. Oh, and, and, and if I could just jump oh. in real quick, one cool activity oh, right that, 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 one cool activity that I think everybody can do, and each mentee doesn't necessarily have to have a mentor with this, but maybe what you want to think about doing is do building partnerships with either individuals or let's say different professions that's either within your area or just people that you know. It doesn't even matter if it's in your area. Let them do a virtual tour. Let them do a virtual tour of, of where they are. So even if you're in Boston and let's say you know uh, someone that works at Google out, out in Silicon Valley, let them do a virtual tour and then do like a cool Q&A there because sometimes it's, it's a moment. Sometimes, you know, while we want things to happen over time, but sometimes it's just when you think about a lot of people to say, oh, uh, you know, when did you find your, your, your purpose, whatever, oftentimes they'll mention this one moment, this one thing. So don't be afraid to bring in individuals to sort of kind of bring this virtual experience as well um, to different things that kids may have an interest in. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and, you know, it, there, there are a lot of questions about specific, you know, ways to train um, mentors, and including online. Um, but I think one of the questions that, that has um, arisen to the top, I think, here is um, if, if either of you have a how-to example um, and how you would provide a mentor, um, uh, how you would provide a mentor training um, around how you advise a mentee um, and allow them to lead uh, versus, you know, the what has been standard um, in that the mentor is the lead. Um, how do you allow the young person to take the lead in the situation, and how do you train mentors to have that kind of mindset? So, so if I can yeah. ask you for clarity, are, are we talking about training of the mentor? Or do, are we talking about um, training the mentor in terms of the uh, how to 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 to, to deliver to deliver um, you know the guidance to the mentee? Is that it? I just want to make sure I have clarity yes. here. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Using some of the principles that both you and uh, Kendall described. Okay. Um, I'll defer. I'll defer to you. Then I'll speak. That's fine. I'm sorry, you want me to answer? Yeah, so I think there sure, are a number sure. of things that, again, um, we have found in our studies are really effective. So the first thing I would recommend is that it's really important that mentors model purpose. You know, all too often we forget to talk about what our own source of purpose in life is. We forget to share that with young people in our lives. And so helping to uh, share your own source of purpose in life with a young person is really important. You know, maybe you find purpose in being a mentor and letting somebody know that would not only help facilitate the development of that relationship, but would also help the young person sort of introduce the young person to the language of purpose and to sort of thinking about what are the things that I do in my life that are really meaningful to me. So I think the first thing that I would encourage um, in a sort of mentor training session around how to cultivate purpose is make sure you're modeling purpose. Make sure you're 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 sharing your purpose as well. Um, a second thing that again we have found in our studies to be really effective is asking young people about you know what is it that you want out of life. I think um, again with that feedback that we got from our interviews is that young people aren't asked these questions very often. In fact. 
very rarely. We always are asking young people, you know, what are you going to do uh, next semester? What classes are you going to take? What colleges are you going to apply to? Very sort of short term um, kinds of questions. And, uh, you know, focusing on the long term and focusing on um, um, what, what it is they want out of life is a really effective way of getting them to kind of think about their own source of purpose in life. Um, one of the other things that I would encourage mentors to try is to help to cultivate that sort of grateful mindset. Again, we find that that's really, really important. When you can help young people to focus on the blessings in their lives and on the people who have blessed them, our studies are finding that they're just sort of naturally inclined to start to think about how it is that they want to give back. And so having those kinds of conversations um, can be really, really effective. Um, a third step that a mentor might think about is reaching out to friends and family. So again, as I said with that email activity, young people may not know what their purpose is, but sometimes the adults in their lives have a good idea. So asking young people to do something as simple as sending emails to the five adults who know them well, asking, you know, what do you think I'm good at? What do you think I uh, really enjoy doing? And how do you think I'll leave my mark? can end up with, you know, you can end up with lots of really good um, information um, that can help the young person think, you know, they may or may not decide that's exactly what their purpose is, but it's definitely going to get them thinking. And then the fifth thing would be to really focus on the young person's strengths and on their values. So what are you really good at and what do you really care about? Um, and having those kinds of conversations, and then trying to think about how can they bring those two together. So we recently interviewed a young person who was a really good writer, and she talked a lot about how she was a good writer, and she really cared about political issues. And so she talked about, as she was kind of uh, going through the interview, how she might she was really interested in becoming a speech writer and writing sort of persuasive and inspiring political speeches. So just asking uh, the right kinds of questions can help young people sort of um, draw connections between what might seem like disparate ideas. So modeling purpose, um, focusing on the heart, far horizon, helping young people to sort of foster gratitude in their lives, to encourage them to reach out to friends and family, and to then help them sort of focus on their strengths and values. Um, all of those are approaches that we have found in our research to be very effective for a large number of, of young people. And, and I mean, and that, that's correct. And if I, I can jump in on the practitioner side, sure. um, through, our national, through our National Guide Right program, we made purpose development um, a core aspect, a core component of our programs. And I headed up the training uh, for of our Guide to Right directors, and we have about 320 of them. And I have been doing uh, we actually created a module in terms of purpose development, and we actually have our with the, here in the high school with our peer mentors who are seniors. We train them on purpose development. The number one important thing that we do, we start off with, is putting all of our mentors through the training first and treat them as if they're the mentee. Because what's so critical is you can't you can't help a kid or help a young mentee find out what purpose is when if you yourself have not gone through that, even if it's the questioning, you don't necessarily have to have come to your own conclusion. But if you haven't even begun the process of your own personal discovery, then it's sort of kind of hard to, you know, it's almost like the blind leading the blind. So we, we break it down. I'll just give you a synopsis of the type of training that, that we provide and that I do. So, so the first ask, you know, the first aspect of it, one thing goes back to those three critical questions focusing on skills, focusing on passion, and, and then focus on the impact. And we, because we're dealing with adults or we're dealing with older individuals, we like to do that in a group. So I would recommend for your mentors, help them do that in the group. Because a lot of times, just through conversation comes discovery um, simply just for them. And there are like different activities that we do. Like um, we do things such as, you know, go back to the time when you were, you know, between five and 10. What were the things that you love to do? And we actually call it, you know, follow the breadcrumbs. Whereas a lot of times people will start to realize that the things that they love or that their purpose and their passion now are things that they were love and their passion was when they were young kids. And so we'll do we'll things of that nature, but also conversation, how you write that down, the type of questioning that we do there. And then, of course, like I said, you know, we train them on now asking the fundamental question of 
if you wanted to find your purpose, you know, what type of tools, what type of resources, what type of advisement do you think you would need to then reach that, to reach that goal? And it allows them, it allows the mentor to really think about, wow, you know, simply being motivated is not enough. Here's what I need. Why is that important? Because once again, this is what happens to a lot of mentees. We tell them they can do it, they can do it, they can do it. But far often not, the, the, the part that we leave out is providing them the tools and resources so that they have the support system and capacity to actually then, you know, execute their, their direction towards that. And I'd say you really want to focus on that and really help. And then also I'd say as part of the training is constantly as a mentoring organization, check in with your mentors and to see and helping them cultivate their own purpose because you have to guide them through because as you're guiding them through, it makes them far better in terms of then using their experience for themselves to help um, to help the mentee guide through. Now, there are other things that I do. There are a series of books, um, and there are a series of different practices that I use. I'll be honest here, enough, I actually tend to use more Eastern, um, Chinese, and Confucius-based philosophies um, in terms of a mentor of a mentoring approach than I really do Western-based because Western-based tends to be more hierarchy, you know, leader, follower, superior, inferior, as opposed to Eastern based, which, which tends to try to keep everybody on a, on an equal level. And it's about more guiding and advising and tapping into potential. Thank you, Almani. Those are both great points, um, Kendall and Almani. Um, and we have time for probably one more question um, before I'll turn it back to Jen to wrap us up. But, um, and, and, this was, is related to something you had said earlier in the presentation, Kendall, about how you're focused on adolescents um, simply because younger children are at a different developmental stage. Um, so someone asked the question, you know, it was mentioned that focusing on purpose should really be more geared toward older youth. I'm working with a program that is peer mentoring between high school and kindergarten youth. Would that be a good opportunity to try to do activities about purpose? Would kindergartners be able to take part in a meaningful way? Um, I think that would be a, a great question to to end us with. Yeah, no, I think that's a that is a great question. Um, I mean, I don't really think that uh, kindergartners are likely to be thinking seriously about what it is that they want to accomplish in their lives. But at the same time, I don't think that means that they can't start engaging in some activities. Um, to help them think more about how they can contribute to the broader world. So um, in giving a talk at a, a, to an association, I talked with a, a kindergarten teacher, actually, and she said that one of the things that she did, and I thought this sounded fantastic, was at the end of each day, she had all of her kindergartners get, sit around in circle time. And I guess I should back up a little bit. At the beginning of the school year, they decided that their goal was to be the best um, class on campus. Their, their kindergarten classroom was going to be the best classroom on campus and they were all going to help one another and, and they just wanted to be the happiest sort of um, best classroom where everybody kind of wanted to be. So they decided that the way they were going to do that was every day everybody had to make an effort to contribute to making their classroom the best classroom um, in the school campus. And so at the end of every school day, they would all get around in their circle time and they would share a story or an account of how they contributed to making that classroom the best classroom it could be that day. And so she said, you know, sometimes kids would say, so um, without even being asked, I helped water the flowers or, you know, I noticed that so-and-so was kind of sad at lunchtime, so I went and sat with them. And the idea is just that there's, you're teaching young people to start to think about how it is that they can contribute to the world beyond themselves. And in the case of a kindergartner, that that world is a little bit smaller. It's their classroom. But I think that that's a really important lesson. And I don't think it's too early to start thinking about that in kindergarten. Um, and, and like I said, I think that's an important sort of you know, that the, the ability to think about how you can contribute to the broader world is, is a really critical antecedent to the development of purpose. Wonderful. I, All right. I, I, oh, Almani. Sure. sure. Go ahead. No, just lastly, I, I, I got to wholeheartedly agree there with that. Um, and, and, and what's interesting is I think that when you're dealing with kinders, so let's say um, kindergartners, kindergartners through third grade, 
they're interestingly enough are going to show because you know they their mind is not so formalized they're really going to show the things i think that they have significant enjoyment in right and so while we may not call it purpose you may not say oh this is your purpose but i think what's important for the mentor or or, or the educator is to continue to reinforce confidence in um in whatever skills and talent or love that that the, the young person is showing at that age group. Now, what ends up happening is, and what I've seen, is that by the time you get to like fourth, fifth grade, they really begin to show, and I actually begin to show some sort of like um, definitiveness in the things that they really love. And once again, it's about really um, promoting that. And I think at that age, that's when you got to start providing some resources ar- around that, right? Um, and and ultimately just keep them going in that area. I think what we you have to be cautious what we have to be cautious of is to simply say, okay, you're good at this, okay, um and, and just just blow it off. So yeah, can you find can you find that? Is that existing? Are those activities? Oh, by all means, because once again, like I said, we do an activity called that I've defined as following the breadcrumbs. And a lot of times, even if it's not the career itself, but a lot of the attributes and elements um, that exists within the direction or that make up one's purpose are there because it's built in our DNA. So they exist there every, anyway as evidence in those ages. So the more, in conclusion, the more you can support those things that, that a kid is doing, the more that you can highlight, bring awareness to these talents that you may see that they may not see themselves, is the more you keep them on that path. And then, of course, like I said before, making sure you then support that not just through emotional support, but then through any capacity or resources or external environments that places them in that field so they can feel whether or not they belong in that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Almani and Kendall, for your experience, for sharing your experiences and your expertise on this topic. I think it was really helpful to folks on the line. We're getting a lot of questions and, and thank yous coming in. So we really appreciate mm-hmm. you sharing everything yeah. that you shared today. And thanks to Elizabeth for leading that conversation. So I'm going to start to wrap us up here. Um, I want to talk through a few additional resources that Mentor and some of our partners offer. Mentor scales impact by developing and supporting a national network of affiliates. These affiliates provide the leadership and infrastructure necessary to support the expansion of quality mentoring relationships in local communities or statewide. Affiliates also serve a unique role as a clearinghouse for training, resources, public awareness, and advocacy. So we encourage you to click this link uh, when you receive these slides and find out whether you have an affiliate in your region and connect with them to learn about local resources in your area. Additionally, we encourage you to register your program with the Mentoring Connector, a national national database of mentoring programs. This zip code searchable database allows mentors and mentees from across the country to find your program. And finally, check out the OJJDP National Mentoring Resource Center website for no-cost mentoring resources to help you apply evidence-based mentoring practices to your program. The OJJDP NMRC provides evidence reviews on mentoring models and mentoring for special populations, implementation resources from training manuals to mentor guides, um, and a blog featuring innovations and best practices for practitioners. There's also an opportunity to request no-cost technical assistance for your program. And as a reminder, one week after this webinar, all attendees will receive an email containing a link to the CMWF webpage where we'll post the recording, slides, and additional resources. And also, don't forget, we'd love your feedback. At the end of today's webinar, please answer the short survey and help us make this series even better. Be sure to visit the CMWS page on the Mentor website for an an archive of all past webinars and information about upcoming webinars. And finally, I just wanted to thank everyone so much for joining today. I know that January is National Mentoring Month, and I'm sure you're all very busy, but we appreciate you taking the time for this conversation. Um, And we'd encourage you to join us for our next webinar, which is on February 22nd. 1 to 2 15 p.m. Eastern, and the topic will be match support. Again, thanks so much, everyone. Take care.